at the end of last week's lesson. Paul was talking to about us about the grace of God and how the grace of God is able to uh, cover any sin that you have ever committed. And if the grace of God is greater than any sin that you have ever committed. In fact, if you would pile up all the sins in this room and pile them on one person and multiply that to every person in this room, the grace of God is still able to be greater than all the sins piled on of all this room to one person, multiply it all to the rest of the people. The grace of God is so much greater. It is able to cover those sins. This, this um, past uh, Tuesday, we have a widow in our church who somebody had piled all this trash in her front yard. And so I took 30 kids over to clean that trash up. Well, on the way, we stopped at another spot and cleaned out a shed inside. We opened up the shed. It was full. I mean, 10 by 15 shed, just full. Took us 15 minutes with 30 kids. Boom, it was cleaned out in the truck. We took over and dumped it. Everything went fine. We drove up in front of this house where this pile of mess was that went across the entire front. And the kids got out thinking, eh, look at that. That pile of mess, it's a piece of cake. Well, people, kids don't realize that a mess outside never looks as big as it really is. I don't think any of y'all, y'all probably know what I'm talking about. Inside, you can go, okay, this is a 10 by 15 room. This is a pretty big mess, but it's confined by the walls. But outside, when it's just kind of strode out about yay high off the ground, and it goes for about 30 feet, that's a mess. <clears throat> well, you've heard me talk about the difference between boys and girls. And what I think about the sinful nature of boys and girls, that guys, I know what you think about, and you sin. And girls, you're just as pure as the driven snow. Don't tell me different. All right? It proved to me on Tuesday afternoon, except for it got twisted just a little bit. For on Tuesday afternoon, we show up, we get out, they say it's a piece of cake. For an hour and a half, we toil on that pile, and we have it about halfway done. And I turn around... And the 15 guys are over drinking water underneath the tree, and the girls are still at it. Just still at it. We got this job to get done, and they're just at it. And I kept saying, guys, what are you doing? We'll be there in a minute. And the girls are just keeping at it. I said, okay, girls, you'll get your chance. They just keep at it. Girls never quit. Took us three hours to clean that mess up. Girls never quit. Well, in the midst when the guys were not there, I said to the girls, I said, girls, you know, y'all are as pure as driven snow. I just love y'all. Y'all are great. You know, I want to give you a hint. If you will confess one of your sins every time you pick up a stick, you ought to just about be done by now. And this beautiful, beautiful 17-year-old girl looked at me and says, she says, Oh, Dr. Jim, there's not enough sticks here for my sins. <laughs> Just blew my mind. I looked at, no, you know, can't be. Well, there's enough grace to cover all of that because she's a saved person and for all of her sins that she has, she's a saved person and the grace of God can cover all of that. And instead of just looking at the overall picture of our daily lives, uh, God is an overall picture of wickedness and goodness in our lives. God has given us the law that tells us how to deal with our daily lives, of everything that happens in our daily lives. And so we know what a sin is now because God has given us the book, the law that tells us what a sin is. And that God's grace, even though we have that checklist of sins, God's grace is able to be greater than all the sins that we have ever done and ever commit. Chapter 6 verse 1 picks up on that and says, What then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? You catch that? That's the question. Well, since we get grace, and we want more grace, because grace is the gift of God, can we just go ahead and sin some more? Let's chalk some more sins up so that grace will be greater. No, we don't want to do that, do we? No, we don't want to do that. May, may it never be, Paul says. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead 
through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in a newness of life. Now, I want you to understand what he's saying. We've already talked about this and we're going to talk about it more. Let's say this little old group right here represents your pile of sins. Okay? These are your pile of sins. Now, don't everybody put your sins in the same pile. That's just one of your pile of sins. Got that? Every one of you got your own pile of sins. When you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, at the moment you accept Christ as your Savior, not only does God overlook this pile of sins to look forward to something else, but this is what God does to that pile of sins of everything that you have done in the past. Before you accept Christ as Savior, God does this to your record and to your pile of sins. He makes you as if they weren't even there. He wipes them away. Your chart is clean. It is available to all Christians one time in their life to get their chart wiped clean at that, from, from all the deeds of the past. Now after salvation, your chart is still wiped clean as your deeds are happening because of your relationship with Christ. But there's none that hang on. They don't pile on. I don't listen. I struggle with this with, with teaching you Romans because I want to go on down into chapter seven and talk about what happens in chapter seven at this point. But let's cover that topic of wait a minute, do I still sin? And what happens when I still sin? Let's wait till we get down to chapter seven of that. Let's cover where we are right now. So I want you to understand he's talking about it gives an example about baptism at this point. Okay, I'm gonna need some help. Uh, let's see here. Can you come up and give me some help? Come here. Come here. I'm only, I need some help. Right here. What is your name? Cameron. Cameron. Okay, stand right here. Have you been baptized yet? Uh, yes. You have? Yeah. Okay, good. Then you know what we're going to do. All right, I'm going to put your hand here. Yeah. Grab hold right there. Grab that good. Okay, grab the other hand. Okay. Whenever you see me baptize or anyone, there's some things we say, and there's some important things that we say. We, can you stand straight? Mm -hmm. You sure you can stand straight? Yeah. Okay. Dave, we're going to go all the way down, so you're going to have to be ready. Don't get his bald head on top of it. All right, there. ready? <laughs> we're standing here, and I baptize like this. I'll say, in obedience to the command of our Father, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You all all hear that. But most people miss what we say next. We say, keep your body stiff. Relax these. Down, down boy, down boy. Okay, here we go. We say, keep your legs straight, okay? Hold on, hold, hold for tight. Okay, I don't want to drop you. We say, you were buried with him into the likeness of his death. Got it? You ready? Keep your body straight. Can you keep it straight? Straighter. Straighter. Okay? All right, hold it straight, grab hold again. And we say, you are raised to walk in the newness of life to serve your Lord forevermore. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Cameron. All right. That's what happens to us when we get saved. We have died to our sins. We, and he, that's what the whole picture of baptism is. Whenever we are baptized, it's a picture of what has happened to our sins. All of our pile of sins have been buried and they're out of sight and they have been wiped clean from our life. We are buried with Him in the likeness of His death and we are raised to walk in this newness of life. And so it is by the grace of God that that happens. Verse 5. Yes, sir. Okay, yes, uh, what, what Jim has said is at that point in time whenever Christ gives you your na new name that is written up in glory so that Satan does not know your name, that inscribed name. By the, de by the way, if you go back to the Revelation, at some point in time when you go to be in heaven, you're going to receive a white stone that has that new name written on it. Okay? You got it? Remember that from the Revelation? Oh, how quickly. 
We're going to have them DVD sets just sold quickly. We're going to keep referring back to them. You're going to have to go get that and listen to it again. Your new name is written up in glory at that point in time that Satan does not know or the devils don't know or nobody else knows because it's in the record books of God. Okay, going on, verse 5. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. Hang on, because you've got to get through this whole passage. We can't just grab that verse and say you're free from sin. You're free from all of those old pile of sins. Those old pile of sins have been buried and are gone at the point in time when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior for that moment. And then you've got to start all over again. Because now you're not going to be a slave to sin, but you're going, to be a, you're going to be freed from sin, and you need to be a slave to righteousness. But righteousness is something that is bestowed on you because God gives it to you. It's something He bestows on you. It's nothing that you can earn. It's something where God gives you according to what your heart's desire is, as we will see here in just a minute. Look here. But by the grace of God, you get it. Verse 8. For if we have died with Christ... Remember that? Taking Cameron down. Died with Christ. We believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here we've got a heart issue. You have died with Christ. Just as Christ died, never to die again, risen from the grave, to live forever, death has no authority over him, death has no sting again over him, death cannot master him at all, so too uh, look at sin in the exact same way. Whenever you accept Christ as your Savior, never again look at sin in a manner that allows you to continue to sin, but think of yourselves as being dead to sin. When a sin happens, when it comes about in your life, when it comes looking at you, an uh, 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 issue comes looking at you face to face, and it's one of your addictions, folks, you just look at it and you, and you have to make a decision. Do, I'm lusting after this. Do I reach out and grab it? Or do I push it away? Uh, many, many years ago, when I was still called Jimmy, <laughs> okay, still called Jimmy. One of the deacons in my church was going to give me some lessons in, in, about, about lusting. Actually, he said it to a bunch of us who were there. And he said, Jimmy, you know lusting. You know what lusting is, son, don't you? And I said, no, no, Mr. McNulty, what, what is lusting? And he said, lusting's the second look. <laughs> you see, we're all going to, and he's right, we're all going to see something that we should not see. We're all going to see things that are just not right. But lusting is not seeing it and dwelling on it. Lusting is seeing it and saying, I'm not dealing with it. You say it in your mind, I'm not dealing with that. Or I'm not looking at this as a lustful situation. Lust is whenever, and the sin happens whenever you go, hmm, hmm, hmm. You got it? All right, that's when the sin happens in the Garden of Eden. That woman, that woman was talking to that old snake. And that old snake said, you know, this little piece of fruit right here would be really good. And the woman quoted what the Lord had said to Adam, but she had not heard it. Because if you look in the text, the Lord told Adam what he could eat and what he couldn't eat of one law Thou shalt not eat of the tree of good and evil. That law came to him before Adam, before Eve was created. Look in the text, chapter 2 of Genesis, okay? So she didn't hear it from God. She just was heard it from what Adam had said. She tells that law to that snake, that serpent, and she misquotes it. And then that serpent requotes it back to her correctly, of the way the Lord really said it to Adam, 
but he adds a few extra words. And she takes that old little piece of fruit and she goes over to her hubby. And she says, hubby, this would be really good. Let's try this. Doesn't it look good? And she was deceived by the serpent. Adam knew what the law was. One law, only one law. You can do everything else. In fact, you can run all over this garden in your nudie. That's without your bathing suitie. <laughs> and it was okay for them. It was okay. And Adam took that fruit and he was disobedient. He knew he shouldn't have eaten that fruit. When he takes a bite, gives it to her, she takes a bite, she's deceived, he's disobedient. Next thing that happens is the Lord says, Where are you, Adam? Where are you, Eve? And Adam says, We're hiding ourselves. Why are you hiding yourselves? Because we're naked. And you remember what the Lord says? Who told you you... There was only two people on the world. Who's a who? <laughs> it's got to be one of them. It's got to be Satan or one of the demons or something like that. Or just the innate instinct knowledge from breaking the law of God told them that behold, they were naked. Now we cover up. And as I look out here in this crowd, I'm glad we cover up. <laughs> Because everybody looks better with some clothes on, as far as I'm concerned. Well, they knew they were naked. They knew they had sinned. They knew they needed to cover up. Well, they covered up with fig leaves. Now, have you ever felt the back of a fig leaf? How did they stitch them things together? I don't even want to think about that anymore. But I have that picture in my, that, my mind that, that it was pretty rough. And they were trying to cover themselves, just like man tries to cover themselves, always when we sin. But salvation, we've got to master that before it masters us. When we have sin in our lives, we have to master it before it masters us. Verse 8, For if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over Him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Do you know what a mortal body is? Cameron, do you know what a mortal body is? Pinch yourself. You just pinched your mortal body. Got it? That's us. That's this fleshly body that we got, okay? It's our mortal body. It's, it, it, this, this mortal body one day will put on immortality where it can never hurt, never pain. When y'all got out there and got stuck by that needle out there, that vampire bus a while ago, that blood bank bus, you know, that little thing just hurt for a little while. That's what happens with this mortal body. We can get cut, we can get burned, we can get bruised. Sin can reign inside this mortal body. Never again let sin reign in this mortal body. Hey, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. In other words, we should be dead to sin. We should not let sin do anything to us. We must master it before it masters us. And yet, Paul knows that we're going to sin. And he's talking specifically to these Jews in Rome right now that's got all this problem with keeping the Jewish law from last week. Got that? He hadn't changed the context of who he's talking to. But the grace of God is able to overcome all the sins that happen in our mortal bodies. But we've got to present ourselves, as our bodies, as instruments of, not of unrighteousness, but we present ourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin is not to be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. As being under grace, we have the grace of God to know what a sin is because the law tells us, but have the grace of God not to allow sin to happen in this body that we live in. We have to make a choice. Now I know, the, as, as sure as I'm standing here in front of you, there's not a single one of you that's sinless in here. That today... Before you got here, one of them sins happened. It just did. 
in the way you said something to somebody or you did something or you thought about something or some action, some action you did, sin crouched in on you and something happened today that you committed a sin. It's just the way it is. But we can't allow it to master us. We have to control it because we live under grace. Verse 15, what then? <laughs> Love this verse. Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? <laughs> May it never be. I like the way the King James says it. It's even better. God forbid. So, you know, we're under grace. And the grace is the gift of God. And the grace always abounds more. So let's go out and do some sinning so we'll get some more grace. Or can we go ahead and sin because we're not under the law, but we're under grace now, and it won't count against us? Absolutely not. You can't go do that. You absolutely cannot go sin because you are redeemed. You belong to God. You belong to God and things are different for you because your slate has been wiped clean so that you get a new start. As we come up, like we are, the picture is like we've died to this sin and we've been risen to live in this mortal body in a newness of life that is different than everybody else in the world who lives out here. Folks, you can't tell a sin. You can't tell a lost man what a sin is. In fact, that's the biggest problem. For those of you who got saved late in life, how many of y'all got saved late in life? Okay. Late. Okay, let's call late after 25. You're already 25? Okay. You don't look 25. <laughs> Shouldn't have gone there. You got late in life. Before you were saved, and you think you, did you think you were a sinner? You knew something was wrong, but you really didn't know what. But then you get saved, and you start reading God's Word, and all of a sudden you're just checking them off. Oops, I used to do this. Oops, that's a sin. I used to do this. Oops, that's a sin. Paul's going to tell us that's exactly what happened in his life. Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace may it never be? Verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, uh, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that, th that though you're, you are, were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Let me explain this to you in a little different way, make an example. Uh, let's see here. Who owns a business in here? Um, oh, you do. Mary, you've got a business. Mary, Mary has um, um, the Hallmark shop down on Egret Bay. In case any of you do not know about that, she has wonderful stuff. Please show up. When she's open, she'd love to see you come in. She will hug on you, love on you, and sell you stuff. Because that's what she's... Uh, merchandise. Because that's what she's in the business for. I need a job, so I come to... Uh, Mary, do you have a manager in your store besides you? Okay, let's pretend that you do, okay? Just pretend that you have a manager in the store. And I go and I need a job, and so I go to her manager of her store, and she's got several stores, okay, by the way. I mean, she really, you only got one, but let's play like she's got several stores. And she just makes it from store to store to store. So she's got a manager in every store. I go and I apply for a job, and the manager hires me. Now, because I've just been hired, I don't say to the manager, now I'm going to be here on Tuesdays and Friday mornings only. N no, wait a minute. The manager tells me when I'm going to be there. She sets the schedule. She might ask me what I need to work around, but she says, you're going to be here from this time to this time. I work for them. I am now a slave to them. By the way, same word here is like employer slave, all right? Same word. We just use it different in the scripture because they... Scripture calls them slaves, but back in there you're a slave, you're an employee, that's what you are. So I work for this manager. When this manager says, lift it, I lift it. When they say, tote it, I tote it. When they say, pull it, I pull it. When they say, push it, I push it. When the truck backs up with the stock and they say, unload it, I unload it. Whenever I, they say, clean it out, I clean it out. When they say, be here at this time, I mean, I am a slave to the or employee of the manager of the store. And I either do good or I do bad. One of the two. And if I do bad, they're not going to keep paying me wages to be there. Not at all. They're going to get rid of me because I, I am not a good employee. 
So the manager's happy with me or maybe not happy with me. And then all of a sudden, Miss Mary shows up. Remember, she's got play like several stores. And she's the one that we're all scared of. And she shows up. The manager says, oh, Mary's on her way today, so uh, let's, get, let's hop to it. Bad thing. You should never have to say that, folks. If you have to say that, something else is going wrong, all right? You're already in the wrong. So Mary shows up, and she's like that, that, that uh, spirit body that you just don't want to disappoint when she shows up. And she shows up, and she doesn't like what I'm doing, and she doesn't like what the manager's doing. She you know what she's going to do? She's going to get rid of both of us because we're not doing right. And if we're doing good, she may say, you know, you're doing good as type boy manager, you're gone. She may say, manager, you're staying, but you've got to straighten this up because you've been with me a long time and, we're gonna, and, and, and you're okay, but you're not doing these right, straighten them up. But you stock boy, you're out of here. You're out of there. You've got to do right. Same things with us in sin, folks. Except for sin is the manager that we either have to do right by or wrong by and when God shows up, He's going to look and see, what have you done with sin? If you make yourself slaves to sin, and your addiction is a slave to that sin, that sin is controlling you. Folks, sin is inanimate. Sin doesn't exist. Look, a catfish is not a sin. But my wife will fish for catfish and throw them back until it's sinful. I mean, she will do it when it's time to be in, it's past curfew, she won't put the rod down. She just won't, okay? Nothing wrong with the catfish, nothing sinful about it, it's just what do you think about that? She just wants to keep pulling. Mm, 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 mm. Look, a house is not sinful. You look, some people look at a house and say, that 8,900 square foot house, got that 8,900 square foot house? That's just sinful. You've heard people say things like that. That house is not sinful. Look at that car. Man, that car. It go 202 miles an hour. That's just sinful. Where are you going to drive a car at 202 miles an hour? The speed limit's on 45. The speed limit, you know, it's only this. That's just sinful. Look at all that gaudy gold that they put all over that office. Well, that's just sinful. It's not sinful. The car's not sinful. A catfish is not sinful. A house is not sinful. You can't, a, nothing out there is sinful. Only people, human beings, can take something and make it sinful. Do you understand that? And it's how you think about it in your heart and in your life. And once you've got to realize, you've got to live as you're freed from sin and so that you are a slave to righteousness. You're going to be a slave to God instead of being a slave to sin. Don't be obedient to the sin when something is dangled out in front of you and it's an old thing that you're, I mean, it's, that's the way the, the devil and his demons does it. They just dangle something out in, in front of you that's your old sin, that you just really, mm, yeah, you, mm, you, you don't like it, but mm, okay, we'll just do it anyway. And you get out there and you want to grasp after it. And when you've done it, you sin. You've allowed it to master you. It's your manager. It's your manager. It's mastering you. You're not mastering it. Sin cannot be something that you do on a regular basis. And as a Christian who is saved, you cannot let sin reign in this mortal body. You must cast it off when it comes. And folks, you've got, all, you've got some sins, I know you do, that whenever it comes up into your mind to do something, you must make a choice at that point. As a Christian, you must make a choice. The choice. We're going to hear Paul talk about that in just a minute, about his choices. Verse 19. He says, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Oh no, he's just told us something else about the Roman church. Not only is he talking to the Jews who got problems of trying to take all this Jewishness and make all these Gentiles be Jewish before they become Christians, now he's talking about the weakness of their flesh. Now this is a church that the world knows, according to the chapter 1, the world knows of their faith, but they're weak. And they're weak in their flesh, he's saying. Look here. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness and resulting in, and for the first time in the book of Romans, we have a new word. The word is sanctification. I want you to understand this. He said, look, in the past, you have allowed yourselves to be slaves and to all this old stuff of impurity. Look, the Roman culture was an ungodly Roman culture, folks. 
And the church is in the midst of that Rome area, and that Rome is controlling the rest of the Roman countryside, and it is ungodly. They've got idolatry. They've got um, idols and false worship. They've got all the Roman culture, which is just ungodly. They've got all the Roman rules and laws that are just ungodly. And they were infiltrating into the Christians who were in this Roman church. And Paul is saying, you're weak in the flesh. Oh, your faith may be strong and may be known worldwide, but you've got a problem with fleshly stuff that's going on. You're doing things that are against the law of God, and yet you're saying, hey, I'm covered by grace. Did you catch it? You all do it too. We all do it. We all do it. We all do something sinful in our life and we call it something else. Uh, when I was in high school, between my sophomore year and my junior year, and between my junior year and my senior year, those two summers, I would work honeybees all day long, go home and throw newspapers. I worked honeybees from the time I was 11 till I was 18, and I threw, I actually got the uh, newspaper job that I started when I was 11. I, I threw that same newspaper route that kept getting bigger for me until I was 18. So for those seven years, I worked honey bees in the morning and in the afternoon, and, and in the evening I would throw newspapers. In those summers, I would head out to Waxahachie Lake to my buddy, uh, Otis Adair. Otis Adair. His family lived out there. And I'd get out there, and we'd go out with our Bowie knives, a box of matches, and a canvas bag that had a drawstring on it, and that's all we took. We, didn't, we went out barefooted, we had shorts on, and our muscle shirts, and that was it. That's all we had. And we survived. And if, if it was on Friday night, we, when we went out on Friday night, we didn't come back into Saturday night uh, so that we could get ready for Sunday morning. We spent every night out on the lake, every night, all summer long from the day school's out until two days before school starts. Why my mother allowed me to do that, I have no idea. I mean, no idea. They had a pipeline running across the lake, and we used to go up across that pipeline, had a big old sign that says, do not danger, do not cross. We just went anyway. Jumped off of it, dove into the water. Water got real low several years after that, and Guy, uh, Otis, his name was Guy, but we called him Otis. We were out in a boat driving around, and we saw all these rebarb sticking up, thinking, you know, we could have jumped on them things. You know, didn't think about it. Well, what, you know, there's something that we did too. When we got hungry, and we weren't able to catch something, well, we'd go up the creek, White Rock Creek, uh, ran into the, the Waxhatchee Lake, and we would take our bags and we could catch the little fish that were coming down that creek. Little be fish about that long. And then we'd tie them up in our bag, we'd keep them down in the water, and we'd go over and we'd find somebody's canoe. Wasn't our canoe, somebody's canoe. Or somebody's rowboat. And we'd hop in that rowboat, and we'd go out to them trot lines that people had out there. And we'd check them trot lines for the people just being good neighbors. Yep, something was on that trot line. We'd say, you know, something's on this trot line. We better take this fish off here before somebody comes along and steals it. <laughs> so we'd take that fish off and rebake that hook and put it back in. We rebaited the hook. We recalled it something to make it have a good flavor to it. You know what I'm saying? We were stealing those fish, but we were... Terminating. Remember the second chapter of Romans? He says, you tell people not to be greedy. You teach people not to be greedy, and yet you're greedy. You teach people not to commit adultery, unless you're committed adultery. You teach people not to steal fish, Jim. Yet you stole my fish. Several times we were able to catch us, legally catch us, some swamp rabbits. Now, if you've not had a swamp rabbit, swamp rabbits live around fresh water. They, they come about this big. I mean, you can eat off of them for a couple of days, and we did. And how we survived, I don't know knowing everything I know about sanitation now and food, food care. And we'd take those things and we'd catch those things and we'd cut them up and we'd go, you know, the first one we ate, it was just kind of dry hanging over and just roasting it. And I thought, man, we got, I got an idea. There's a beehive right over there. I work honeybees. We'd go cut us a piece of grapevine, light that puppy up, blow smoke into that hive, get them bees working. I'd open that hive just like I always did, because I always worked without a net or anything. Take out one of them uh, frames, put that top back up, take it back to the, to the campfire, take that big old Bowie knife, stick it in the fire, get it red hot, cut those caps off. Mm -mm -mm. Take the honeycomb out of it, just leave the wire that's in there, there's two strands of wire that goes through it, and we'd squeeze that all over that swamp rabbit as it turned up. Ooh, you haven't had swamp rabbit until you've had honey roasted swamp rabbit. 
All I needed was a spiral slicer for that thing. I tell you what, it'd have been really, really good. We'd eat off of that several meals, two or three days. Then we'd take the framer to go back and put it in in the hive because we didn't want to steal the frame. <laughs> Don't mention that we just stole a pound of honey. Okay, it's all in how you look at it, right? Teaching y'all how to sin is what I'm doing here. The problem is that on that frame it has this little honey uh, uh, encrusted form that allows the bees to form those, that comb just perfect so you can cut the comb off with a hot knife, put it in a sp cylinder, spin it and all the honey goes out and then you take that same frame and you put it back in, they fill it back up, cap it off. You go get it again, cut the stuff off. That's what you just keep doing over and over again. When you put that frame back in, it's got those two wires in it. It doesn't have the frame form in there. The honeybees just do what they do. They just make that honeycomb come this way and coming this way a little bit. Over here this. Every time you open a hive and you've got honeycomb growing like that, you know somebody's been in the hive. I know because I have been there. <laughs> Many times I've opened a hive and somebody's been in the hive and stolen the honey off of the, off the hive. Now the problem with that is, most cases to get that really good honey... <laughs> Well, never mind where it is. For, forget that. Okay. you got to really work to get to that, that part of the honey. It's on one of the supers. And so, oh, supers is a small box. Never mind. Never, that's all terminology. The issue is on the sin. I mean, I justified stealing the honey to get it on the rabbits, get it on the swamp rabbits, so it would make it taste better. And it did taste better. But it's still sin. It's still sin. You don't feel as bad as you used to? Don't come... Do not compare yourself to me. You're not as bad after all. <laughs> oh my, verse 20. And I would go back to that life in a heartbeat. That was sure simple life. But I'd be caught by now. They'd shoot me by stealing honey. As, as much as, as high price as honey is. For when you were slaves of sin, verse 20, you were free in regard to righteousness. When sin was your master, you knew nothing about righteousness. There was no righteousness in your life when you were slave to sin. It controlled you. It controls you. Verse 21, therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things which you are now ashamed? Now that you know what was a sin, were you deriving any benefit from that sin whatsoever? Think about your past life. Think about before you were saved. Some of you need to, not, need to think about what you did yesterday. Did you derive anything, Kurt, did you derive anything good from that sin yesterday? I had to get your back. Did you derive anything good from it? Did it come to any? No, it didn't come from any good. For the outcome of those things is death. But now, and he's talking about before salvation and after salvation here. But now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification... And the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is sanctification? Sanctification in Scripture, some of your Scripture use the word holiness. It's the same thing. It means set apart. You are different from the rest of the world. On the day you got saved, you are different than the rest of the world. Absolutely different. You are to walk different. You're to talk different. You're to be different. You don't go to the same places. You don't eat the same foods. You don't drink the same stuff. You are totally different from the rest of the world. The whole book of Leviticus is a book about how the Jews were to be different from the rest of the world. The whole book is about being different, about being set apart, being different, being changed. You are a new life. You are a new creature. No longer you to go do those old things. In 19... In 1983, as a youth minister, I took a group of kids down to Corpus Christi, to Morgan Avenue Baptist Church. Jack Chastain was the pastor. Several groups had come in. And the groups had all come in, and, and um, he had one area, because we were getting in late. I had just gone to church, and I just called him to see if we could come down there and do a mission trip. He said, yes, I, I've got one area that is not taken yet, and other groups don't want it because they've tried it and it's too hard. And I said, what is that area? And he said, well, it's our, it's our red light district. Right over here, just away from us, is the prostitution and drug area. And it's just a stone's throw from our church. It's a very rough neighborhood. You don't want to be over in there at night. And this is back in 83, okay? And we think about 
places today the bet. And I said, we'll take it. One of his members had had a house there that had gotten burned. They cleaned it off. They set us a tent up. And we got out there. We started, we canvassed the area. We had vacation Bible school in, in the mornings. And we had revival services at night. First day shows up. A bunch of kids come. Kid is riding his bicycle around. He is in the eighth grade. He's riding his bicycle around. He's watching what we're doing on his banana bicycle with the, you know, gears right here in the middle and handlebars up here and a big old long banana seat. Some of you know what I'm talking about. All of you know what I'm talking about, except for Cameron. He didn't know what I'm talking about. And, and he's riding around, and the first day, and the kids all tell us, man, he's mean. He's, he's killed somebody. He's shot somebody. That's a mean kid. That's a mean kid. Every day, it's a mean kid. That's a mean kid. On the third day, an 83-year-old man who went with us, Mr. Jacob, when, he came, when, when, when that kid came run, riding around, he walked out and stopped that kid in front banana, on his handlebars and said, kid, what are you doing circling around here? just seeing what's going on. He said, well, today's your day, and you're going to come see what's going on. He picks up his front wheel of the bicycle and just hauls the kid in, roll him on the back. <laughs> Brings the bicycle in his tent. He says, that's your seat right there. Sit down. He's got his black jacket on. It's middle of summer, hot. But he's the mean kid. He's got marks all over him. Tat They're not tattoos, but he's marked himself with black markers and all that. His hair's slicked back. You know, he's trying to do that Fonzie thing. That day he's there. That night he comes to the revival and he doesn't come in. He sits on his bicycle outside the back of the tent. The next day he shows up and he sits in his seat. That night he's at the revival. The next day he shows up and somebody's in his seat and he forces him out of his seat to vacation Bible school. <laughs> that night he shows up. The last day of vacation Bible school, we wonder what's happened to this kid, but we had a new kid show up. New kid sitting in his seat. And the 83-year-old man... Jacob looks at him and says, what happened to you? He says, I got saved last night. He says, where's your jacket? Don't need that. Where's your club? Don't need that anymore. He would cut his hair. He didn't have the marks on his face. For the next four years, he was always there. He was a witness for God. He's a minister right now. He got saved. Changed overnight. Became a new creature. And all his old life had been passed away when he heard the gospel of God, which is about the Son of God, which is the power of God unto salvation. We've got to run on our time. Here's the free gift of God. When you get it, you're set apart. You're different. You don't need that old life anymore. You don't need those old sins. You're different. You're set apart. You're changed. Romans chapter 7 verse 1. He says, Or do you not know, brethren, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? You can't get away from the law, he's saying, you Jewish folks. You're saying, I'm living under grace, but I, you can't get away from the law. The law is what tells you what is sin. And then he gives an example. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. This is an Old Testament law. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning of her husband. So all these widow women out there, if they want to get married and their husbands died, get married. There's nothing wrong with it. There's no sin in that in the eyes of God. Then he goes on to say, so then, if, while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. That means while she's still married to her husband, she goes and has a sexual relationship with another man, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, he is, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, but she is joined to another man. In other words... Her husband dies, and she goes and gets married to another man. She is free from that law that kept her bound to her husband, and she is now free to marry this other man, and she is not an adulteress. Now, wait a minute. You're saying, well, what about a woman who is who's a widow, and she goes and has a sexual relationship with a man not being married to him? Is that adultery? The answer is no. That's what our teenagers and college kids get into. That's not called adultery when they have sexual relations. It's called fornication. And when a married woman loses their spouse or a married man loses their spouse and goes has a sexual relationship with a man out of wedlock or a woman out of wedlock, that is called fornication. He's talking about marriage relationships here. If a person goes while they're still married to another person and has a relationship with someone, it is called adultery. That is the law. It is a sin, and you shall not do it. In the same way, he says, verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, 
You shall, were also made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to one another, to him who is, was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Take the example. Woman has a relationship with a man while she's married to a husband who's still alive. She's an adulteress. Bring it on over is what Paul's doing. Christian who has a relationship with God and goes has a relationship with a sinful act is an adulteress to God. You got it? That's what he's saying here. You don't go over and do this worldly stuff while you're in a relationship to God. And by the way, you're in a permanent relationship to God once you enter it. Just like when you enter into a marriage, you're into a permanent relationship until that person dies. And so he's saying, look here, go and stay in this relationship to bear fruit for God and don't bear fruit in that sinful relationship whatsoever. You are re you've been released from the law by staying in the right. But if you go back over the sinful action, the law comes back over and has jurisdiction over you and says, that is a sin. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is the law sin? No, may it never be. On the contrary, he says, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. Before sin, remember, before the law, no one knew what a sin was. And therefore, it wasn't a, a check for you or against you. Because we, you did things, but you didn't know it was sin or not. It was not until the law came to the Jews first and the Gentiles later that you knew what a law was. He says... But for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. So did the law create the coveting? Not really. That's not what he's saying. He said, Look, the law came. And then I looked at my life. I've got this document from God, which is the Word of God. It says, If my people who love me and are my beloved, if you do these things, that's a sin against me. So now Paul has a checklist. Whoops, I used to do this, but now that I'm in Christ, that's coveting. Uh-oh, I'm in trouble. And now look here, I did it again, coveting. Mm, mm. I, Paul had trouble with coveting. We knew he had a problem with coveting because he was always on the run whenever he was a Pharisee trying to get in a better place as a Pharisee, so he was persecuting all those Jews. He was on a charge, and what he was doing was trying to build himself up, and that is coveting. Coveting a place where you're not supposed to be, the things you're not supposed to do, doing things. He says, we're not supposed to covet these things. We're supposed to be apart from these things. Apart from the law, sin is dead. Sin doesn't exist if the law is not there because you don't know what a sin is. But once the law came, you know what a sin is. Folks, you're without excuse, just as these Jews are without excuse because they were given the oracles of God. They were given the law of God so that they would know what a sin was. Verse 9. And I was once alive apart from the law. <laughs> when he's growing up. Yeah, kids, they grow up. Cameron, have you ever sinned in your life? How do you know? Everybody has. But your specific sin that you have committed. How old are you? Eight. You're eight. Your specific sin that you have sinned. How do you know something that you did was a sin is, is a sin? You don't know. That's right. You don't know because unless mama told you or daddy told you. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, that's how you know what right and wrong is, right? Because you've been taught, right? Okay, if they had never taught you, would you ever have thought what you did was a sin is a sin? This is an eight-year-old speaking. No, probably not. Didn't know it was a sin. Now, some of the things you do, you go, ooh, I know that's wrong. You know that because it's instinctive in you, but you don't know the checklist. God gave the checklist. Now, some of y'all who are 80 instead of eight, you want me to go to your list of sins? <laughs> don't have enough time. Sin became alive and I died. Because of the commandment, Paul says, I knew that I was sinful finally because of the commandment and I died. You died. It's a, die, it's, it's a, it's a, a death to eternal death unless something happens. 
Verse 11, For sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. In other words, yes, when you recognize what a sin is in your life and you don't create, correct it by going to God, it will bring death to you and will kill you. Verse 12, So then, the law is holy. The law is there for you to know what a sin is, to direct you to God, to correct the sin. The law is holy. The law shows you what sin is. And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Verse 13, Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. That which is the law that is good, did it become a cause for death? No, it became a cause to look to God for life, to correct so that he would know in his heart and his guiltiness what sin was. May it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by effecting my death through that which is good, that through the commandment sin might become utterly sinful. You have to get a point in your life where your sin is utterly sinful, where you know it's a sin. And when it's sin, it's a sin, utterly sinful, and you know you've got to turn to God and you've got to change your life. You've got to change that. You've got to master it before it masters you. Verse 14. Starting in verse 14, we see Paul do something we see he never do anyplace else. He gives a personal example that is so graphic and so detailed and so convoluted because he just keeps repeating and going and digging in even deeper into what he's talking about, about his life. Paul's a saved man. He's spreading the gospel. He is the minister and the apostle to the Gentiles. And yet, look at his, what he's fixed to say as a saved person, and you can relate to this. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh. Sold into bondage to sin, for that which I am doing I do not understand. For I am not practicing that what, what I would like to do, but I am doing the very things I hate. But if I do the very things I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing it is good. In other words, when I sin and the law has told me it's a sin, I'm saying, yeah, the law has told me it's a sin. It's a sin, all right. Sure enough, the law, the law is good. Verse 17, so now, no longer am I the one doing it, but the sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. He saved, folks, and evil is still present in him. That old, sinful, evil nature is still present in him. When you get saved, it doesn't go away. The slate of what you've done before is wiped clean, but now you must master this sinful evil. You must be the master of the store, and sin doesn't master you. Look on, verse 22. For I joyfully concur with the law of God, We've been talking about the gift of God until right now. Now we're talking about the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Okay, here we go. This is me. You ready? I'm just going to say the same thing that Paul does, hopefully in a better way where you can understand it. Nothing better than this, but you're going to understand it. Here I am standing between God and my sin that I'm thinking. I look to God, I look to the sin. I look to God, I look to the sin. I look to God, I look to the sin. Oh, I did the sin. Oh, God, I wish I had done the sin. Oh, God, but I love to do the sin. Here it is, sin. I'm sinning again. Oh, no, God, I'm coming back to you. I don't want to do the sin. But, God, I'm trying not to do the sin. Oh, but I'm doing the sin. It's not me doing the sin. Yes, it is me doing the sin because I'm reaching out after the sin because the, the sin has got me tied up. It's mastering me. I'm not mastering it. And Paul says, I've got this problem. Evil is inside of me and I am lusting after this action that I just love to do. Sin is an enemy. You can't do anything. It's only how I'm acting after it. What matters to God is how I deal with that sin. Folks, you're never going to get away from sinful things coming in front of your mind. But how do you deal with it? How do you deal with sin when it flares up in front of you? Do you say to yourself, sin, get thee behind me. And you turn towards God and you're still thinking about that sin. But you're putting your focus on God. You're saying, God, take that sin away. 
Get it out from behind me. I am not going to do that sin. I will never do that sin. I am never going to do it. Please, God, I need your help. I'm going to do your things instead of that sin. You turn around, you look at that sin, you say, sin, I'm not doing it. I'm just not. And after a while, those sinful thoughts won't come to you because some other sin will be dangled out in front of you. They'll try something else to get you. The old sinful nature. This is not anything new. That war that wages in front of us is not anything new. Look back in Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. At the bottom of the page there. Friends, not, not new. This is, this is old as creation of man. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, as if God didn't know. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And look at what he says. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, but you must master it. And as you know, sin was crouching at the door of Cain. Had nothing to do, Cain's offering had nothing to do with it being that, that slain uh, cow. Uh, Cain's offering of the fruit was just fine. The reason why God rejected it was because of how Cain thought about it. It has nothing to do with the physical. It all has to do with what happens in the heart, as we're going to see in the next chapter, and we've also seen in the past. God, according to Romans, and what Paul's writing to Romans, God looks at the heart of what is happening. And when he saw Cain's offering, he did not accept it because of Cain's heart. And as you know the rest of the story, the sin mastered it. Cain hated Abel because his offering was not accepted. He wanted Abel dead, and he did not master that sin, and he killed Abel, and he became a prisoner of his sin, and he could not escape its draw and its desire, and so he brought blood upon the land of the first person killed on this world, Abel. Paul says, says here, he does not want to fall into that same sin of allowing the sins to be his master. Not at all. Even though this sin and evil rage within him. In fact, he says here in verse 24, Wretched man that I am. He's, he's God's apostle. And he's a wretched man. Wretched man that I am. Jim Hastings. I have sins in my life. I, and all, most of y'all do know because you've been on projects with me. I'm not perfect. I am sinful. Yes. Wretched man that I am. But I have to master it before it masters me. Who will set me free from the body of this death? Who can set me free from this sin that's crouching at my door? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. Over here, I'm serving the law of God. When God says it's a sin, this is a sin. But on the other hand, my flesh, with my flesh, the law of sin. Over here, I'm trying to make sure that everything God says is a sin is a sin, and I try not to do it. But then I turn around here and look. This old favorite sin of mine looks at me in the face again. And what do I do about it? i got to look back here and say, okay, it's a, law. it's a sin. The law says it's a sin. It's still drawing me. It's still pulling on me. And I have to say, it's a sin, it's a sin, it's a sin. And I have to look back to God, and I have to say, I am going to live a new life as a new creature because I, my sins have been wiped away, and I'm not going to chalk another one up on the list. But the grace of God will get rid of it. But I'm not going to do it because that changes my sanctification and my holiness. It changes my righteousness. It changes everything about me because God is looking at my heart to see how I deal with it. I can look at the sin dead in the face, and if I can reject it, the Lord knows my heart and that I've turned away from it. It's not the first look at the sin, it's the second look at the sin that'll get you in trouble. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your scripture. Lord, may we turn from our wicked ways, our sinful ways, even though we know we've been redeemed by, by you and we're under grace. The law still tells us what a sin is. And it's still your law. And we still live under it until we have our last breath. And Lord, 
may we live every day turning away from those sinful things that we are doing and turning towards you. Father, we love you so much. Bless your holy name. Amen.